When the subject of legendary Japanese game developers comes up, one name who absolutely must be in the conversation is Platinum Games co-founder Hideki Kamiya. As the director of undeniably classic games like Resident Evil 2 and the original Devil May Cry, as well as more recent modern classics like Okami and Bayonetta, Kamiya's legacy and influence in the world of action games, specifically character action games, is completely unparalleled. One only needs to look at this photo of Kamiya as a young man standing next to his mother to know that there's never really been anyone quite like him in or outside of video games. But one of the things that makes Kamiya so legendary, and one of my personal favorite things about him, is his Twitter account, at PG underscore Kamiya. Specifically, his relationship with Twitter's block feature. Now, to call Kamiya a prolific Twitter user is almost kind of an understatement. The man averages nearly 60 Twitter posts per day, occasionally going up into the high 400 range, and at the time of this video's publication, Kamiya is actually right on the verge of posting his 200,000th tweet. And out of those tweets, a very, very, very large chunk of them contain one key phrase. Blocked. Now, blocking someone on Twitter is effectively the nuclear option. It, it makes it so a person can no longer reply to your tweets, search for your tweets, or even look at your tweets. And for most Twitter users, blocking someone tends to be sort of a last resort. Kamiya, on the other hand, uses blocking differently. He blocks virtually everyone. Fans of his games, other game developers, journalists, his own followers, even people who ask him a question that he's already answered elsewhere. Basically, by sending a tweet to Kamiya, you run the risk of him being annoyed by it, and there's a very, very, very high chance he'll block you for it. And what's special about Kamiya is that more often than not, he won't simply block an offending user. He will do it publicly in the form of a manual, old-fashioned quote retweet, where he says blocked, and then copies and pastes your tweet into the following text behind an RT, uh, basically turning your crappy tweet into a spectacle for his 100,000 plus followers to laugh at. Now, as you might have guessed, people have occasionally tried to troll Kamiya intentionally over the years to get blocked by him, but often this backfires, leading to Kamiya just deftly disposing of these people in a spectacularly public fashion. One of my favorite examples of this is when someone once told Kamiya he couldn't make a good game if he tried, to which Kamiya responded, and what can you make? Poop every day? Ha 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 in fact, Kamiya eventually grew so infamous for his reputation for powerful English language comebacks on Twitter that it actually crept back around into the world of video games. For years, one of Kamiya's favorite replies to questions he didn't feel like answering was, quote, ask your mom. He deployed this reply hundreds and hundreds of times on Twitter, often in reply to fans asking whether or not he'd ever want to see his character Bayonetta in Super Smash Bros. This made it immensely satisfying after Bayonetta was announced as a DLC fighter for Super Smash Bros. for Wii U, and the trailer included a line where Bayonetta says this. If you need to learn how to talk to a lady, ask your mom. A direct reference to Kamiya's tweets that was both in this trailer and in her in-game taunt. But at the end of the day, it's not his snarky replies, it's his reputation for blocking people that raised Kamiya's Twitter status to legendary. And interestingly, you don't even have to be trolling to end up blocked by Kamiya. Indeed, it appears that many of the people who end up blocked by him were sincere fans of Kamiya's work asking him an innocent, if possibly annoying, question. When it comes to who Kamiya decides to block, it appears that intent doesn't even enter into the equation. All that matters is if Kamiya found your tweet irritating. And I think there's something kind of admirable about that. Here's a few examples. You say you love one of his games? Blocked. Ask him to quit blocking people? Blocked. Ask him a question he's answered before, or a dumb question, or a joke question, or even just leave him tagged in your conversation with a friend? Blocked. Blocked. You're all blocked. None of you are free of sin. Now the obvious question here is why? Why is Kamiya so generous with his use of the block button? I've been looking into this for a while, and interestingly, it appears that Kamiya was not always this way on Twitter. If you go back through all of Kamiya's tweets and look at the very first time he ever used the word blocked in a tweet, it was seven years ago in August 2012 when somebody asked him if he'd ever blocked somebody for being annoying. His reply, ironically enough, was, quote, never. Basically, I don't want to do that. That was in 2012, and looking forward just two short years later, Kamiya had transformed into the block-loving Kamiya that we know and love today, blocking people for all their annoying questions, calling them insects and brainless idiots, just the classic Kamiya. So what happened? How did Kamiya go 
from a guy who never wanted to block anyone to one of the most prolific blockers in the history of Twitter. Now, usually we would just have to speculate about this, but in 2015, Kamiya succinctly explained his exact reason why he blocked so aggressively in the form of a four-panel comic he personally illustrated. In the first panel of the comic, we see a dumb-looking, slack-jawed boy, snot hanging out of his nose, wearing a shirt labeled sh poster, in front of a computer with Twitter on his screen. In the second panel, the boy recklessly slams both of his hands onto his keyboard, mashing out the question, fave game? In the third, we see the boy's question fly out of his house in the form of an enormous red arrow, and then in the final panel, we see dozens and dozens of similar, actually identical arrows, flying from all over the world, all converging on the Osaka Prefecture of Japan, where Platinum Games is headquartered. Now, as funny as this comic is, it also gives us an unprecedented bit of insight into Kamiya's relationship with Twitter. See, from the perspective of the kid in the cartoon, he's just asking an innocent and well-intentioned, if very unoriginal, question to one of his favorite game developers. But from Kamiya's perspective, this is a question that he's been asked hundreds of times, a question he's been inundated with basically every day for years, and just one question of many that he is absolutely tired of fielding. See, I love this comic because it points to a fundamental flaw in the way Twitter works for public figures. Anyone with a sizable Twitter following knows what it's like to get the same questions over and over, but to me, the fascinating part of this is Kamiya himself and his unique zero-tolerance response to this problem. I sincerely believe that there is nobody else on Earth who uses Twitter in quite the way Kamiya does. Take, for example, his follow list. Kamiya only follows one person, and that's Japanese model Maho Hashimoto, who once cosplayed Kamiya's character Bayonetta at the premiere of the Bayonetta animated movie. Somebody once asked Kamiya why he only follows one account, and Kamiya replied, quote, "'Cause polygamy is prohibited in Japan.'" The perfect answer. And just in case it isn't clear by now, I absolutely adore the way Kamiya uses Twitter. To me, it feels as though Kamiya has this very singular idea of how Twitter ought to work, and anytime he encounters any friction between his idea of what Twitter should be and what Twitter actually is, he just insists on his version of the website and then bends the product to his will in order to accommodate it. One fantastic example of this is Kamiya's usage of a third-party website called Twilog. Now at first, Kamiya would actually answer repeat questions from time to time, although in a somewhat angry way, as seen in this tweet, quote, As I've said, 100,000 billion, 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 billion times, I hate horror games slash movies cause scary and grotesque. Eventually though, in Kamiya's ongoing effort to combat the repeated questions problem, he decided he would demand that people search through all of his old tweets before ever asking him anything. But because Twitter's built-in search function is so janky and inconsistent, Kamiya decided to use a third-party Japanese Twitter searching service called Twilog and to require everyone to search it before sending him a message. And to spread the word about this policy, Kamiya would frequently tweet something to the effect of, repeat, check my Twilog before asking something. Kamiya would tweet this message every day for years, all in an effort to just not see the same questions over and over. But sadly, it made no difference. Kamiya once lamented the state of his Twitter replies thusly, quote, I wonder why I get lots of posts every day in spite of being the cutest and politest guy in a galaxy who makes beautiful and wonderful games. See, the very things that annoy Kamiya most about Twitter, being asked repetitive questions, being trolled, people having 50, 60, 100 tweet long conversations that they refuse to untag you from, these are things that most public figures have just accepted over time as unfortunate shortcomings of the Twitter platform. But instead of just ignoring these problems like the rest of us, Kamiya takes a much more active approach, wielding the block button like a weapon, blocking everybody who violates his rules, and actively purifying the platform until all that remains is his personal ideal vision of Twitter. Or, as Kamiya once wrote in 2014 after going on a particularly intense blocking spree, now my timeline becomes immaculate. Kamiya has been at this for a long time now. As best I can tell, he first began publicly announcing his blocks roughly five or so years ago. And the entire time I've been following him on Twitter, I've been haunted by a singular question. Exactly how many people has Hideki Kamiya blocked? This question has consumed me for years, in large part because the answer is just completely unknowable to anybody except Kamiya himself. 
The way Twitter is set up means that the size of an individual user's block list is private information and it's completely invisible to everyone but the account holder themselves. The only clue that Kamiya has ever given us as to the size of his block list was once in 2014 he mentioned that it was more than 101 people, an oblique reference to his Wii U game, The Wonderful 101, and also a surprisingly low number that has no doubt grown quite a bit since 2014. Over the years, I've come up with a few different techniques that we could possibly try to find out the size of Kamiya's block list. Uh, one of my early ideas was to just count every single time he ever tweeted the word blocked to try to conjure up a rough estimate, but Kamiya himself has said that sometimes he'll get bored of writing the word blocked over and over and will simply block people in silence without announcing it, so that number would be useless to us. My second idea was to simply send Kamiya a tweet asking him how many people he's blocked on Twitter. And as it turns out, I am not the first person to have this idea. Over the years, multiple individuals have tried to figure out the size of Kamiya's block list, usually by asking him directly over Twitter if they can just see it. And I think you can guess what his response was. I'm just wondering how many people you have blocked. Blocked. How many people are on your block list? Blocked. Can you show us your block list? Blocked. Is there any way to screenshot your block list? I'm curious how many people are on it, including you? Thanks idiots for feeding my block list. Colon D. <laughs> now the way I see it, these people who were slain in the line of duty while valiantly trying to uncover this coveted piece of info are heroes. They all died uh, in an honorable way at the hands of Kamiya's block hammer. But I've always personally been careful to avoid ever tweeting directly at Kamiya so as to not meet the same fate as those who fell before me. I am, as of the time of recording, not blocked by Kamiya on Twitter. Let's see if that changes after this video. Who can say what's gonna happen? But I found myself in a real predicament here because the only person who could answer this burning question was Kamiya himself, but I also knew that if I tweeted at him, that would end my five year streak of remaining unblocked. I had to come up with some way to ask Kamiya how many people he'd blocked, but asking him over the internet was simply not an option. So slowly I realized there was only one solution here and that would be to ask Hideki Kamiya in person. Having run out of options and desperate for some sort of resolution, I knew what I had to do. So I booked a plane ticket and got on a flight to Tokyo in search of answers. After a grueling 12 hour flight, which mercifully I was asleep for most of, our plane finally touched down at Tokyo's Haneda International Airport, and from there I actually had yet another plane ride ahead of me. So I took a short bus ride from Haneda Airport's International Terminal to the Domestic Terminal, and then boarded yet another airplane, this time to Osaka. A plane which, incidentally, I feel like I should mention, was Star Wars themed for some reason. Anyways, soon enough, I found myself arriving in Japan's Kansai region. Upon arriving in Osaka, I paused briefly to regain my composure and also to admire this gachapon vending machine hybrid that was painted to look like a train that they had waiting at the Osaka train station, which, by the way, upon examination, exclusively sold merchandise themed around this character, Maraka Toyokawa, who is the Osaka Railway anime girl mascot. Thought that was worth mentioning. Anyways, the reason I was at the Osaka train station is because I still had one more ride ahead of me, an hour-long train ride from Osaka to Kyoto, until finally, at long last, I arrived at my Airbnb and just collapsed. Now, if you're wondering why my final destination was Kyoto and not Osaka, where Platinum Games is headquartered, there's a very good reason for that. See. Every summer in Kyoto, Japan, there's a small independent game festival called Bit Summit, where both Japanese and international game developers gather to show off the games they've been working on to both the press and the public. But the 2019 Bit Summit festival had one major difference from all the years prior. This year, for the first time ever, Platinum Games would be having a booth at the festival where they would be selling exclusive Platinum Games merchandise, some of which was previously only available to PG staffers. Now the scary thing about this was that as best as I could tell, Kamiya never said conclusively whether or not he would be in attendance at Bit Summit 2019. In the weeks leading up to this year's festival, Kamiya heavily promoted the Platinum Games Bit Summit booth, retweeting at least a dozen tweets about the company's presence at the festival, which you could argue sort of implies he'd be in attendance, but then again, anyone who follows Kamiya on Twitter knows that the man loves to retweet virtually anything, especially things related to Platinum Games. So. Ultimately, I had no way of knowing whether or not Kamiya would actually be there. All I could do was 
cross my fingers and hope for the best. The next day I woke up in Kyoto, and with a couple hours to go before the beginning of Bit Summit, I began looking for some sort of distraction. I was really struck by how beautiful the city of Kyoto was. I'd barely ventured outside of Tokyo in all my trips before this, and I was surprised by just how much I loved this city. I spent the whole morning just strolling around, visiting temples and coffee shops, and it was a surprisingly effective distraction for what was to come. But before long, I knew that day one of Bit Summit was beginning, and it was time for my mission to truly begin. I arrived at the Miyako Messe Convention Center, scenically located on the beautiful Lake Biwa Canal with the picturesque backdrop of the Daimonji mountain range behind it, and I began my trek into the Expo Hall. Now remember, this was my first Bit Summit, my first time ever in Kyoto, and this festival was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It was a massively packed show floor where small doujin games by indie Japanese developers shared floor space with large booths from companies like Nintendo and Sony. I walked a quick lap around the Bit Summit show floor, and at first, Platinum Games was nowhere to be found, and I began to actually worry. I thought to myself, had I somehow misunderstood? My mind flooded with irrational thoughts. Had the language barrier gotten the better of me, and had I somehow accidentally looked at the map from a previous year's Bit Summit? And it was right as that panic started to really set in right as I was walking past the PlayStation booth for the first time, that I spotted it. The Platinum Games booth. And standing in front of that booth, I saw something that I never thought I would get the opportunity to lay my own two eyes on, an unmistakable neon orange bandana that belonged to none other than the likes of Hideki Kamiya. I had found him. Having set my sights on my target, there was still one major obstacle that I had to clear, and that was the language barrier. I don't speak a word of Japanese, and this was a relatively sophisticated question I had to ask him. This is where one of the greatest miracles of this journey transpires. Incredibly, there was one thing about Bit Summit that I had not realized before arriving, which was that because it's a very international event, the festival actually employs a stable of English to Japanese interpreters to help the media conduct interviews. As luck would have it, just a few feet from the Platinum Games booth, I found a small group of Bit Summit staff, one of whom was wearing a lanyard marked Interpreter. I approached them and I told the interpreter what I had in mind, laying out the exact question I had for Kamiya and what I was hoping to accomplish here, and thankfully, she agreed to help. Together, this interpreter and I walked towards the Platinum booth and towards Kamiya, and I honestly had no clue what would happen next. I had seen how quickly Kamiya had dispensed of those who'd asked to see his block list before, and I began to feel certain that I had traveled all this way for no reason, and that Kamiya would meet my request with a simple no. The translator explained to Kamiya what I was asking in Japanese, and then... So cool to see it. Thank you, Kamiya san. Thank you so much. There it was. Kamiya's block list contained 17,398 people. I thanked Kamiya for his time, I thanked the interpreter for her time, and I walked away. I was shell-shocked, not only because I had just become the first person on Earth that Hideki Kamiya had ever revealed this forbidden number to, but also by just the sheer size of that number. 17,398. The number rattled around in my head. I struggled to grapple with the scale of it. If you will, allow me to put this number, 17,398, into perspective. I want you to picture Radio City Music Hall, the largest indoor theater in the world. I want you to imagine filling Radio City Music Hall completely to its maximum capacity, no empty seats, a fully sold out jam-packed show. Now, I want you to imagine doing that three times in a row. That is how many people Hideki Kamiya has blocked one person at a time manually by hand on his Twitter account. That is a mind-blowing number. For the entire rest of my trip in Kyoto, I continued to grapple with this incident. What drives a man, I wondered, to block 17,000 people? Something about it 
felt incongruous with the man I had just met. I mean, however brief my interaction with Camille was that day, I found him to be warm and friendly, nothing at all like the acerbic character he plays on Twitter. So then why is Camille's Twitter the way that it is? Why spar with trolls and block people en masse? Ultimately, there's only one person who knows the true answer to that question, and that is obviously Camille himself. But personally, I have my own theory. It's only very recently that we've begun to have serious conversations about the toll social media can have on mental health, particularly for people who live their lives in the public eye. Every public figure with an online presence has to deal with some form of abuse from strangers, and we're told over and over that it comes with the territory, that it's just part of the job, that we're better off just ignoring it and never feeding the trolls. But the wonderful thing about Hideki Kamiya is that he doesn't accept that. When I look at Kamiya's Twitter, I see a man fiercely defensive of the one small corner of the internet that is entirely his. A man who won't let himself be dehumanized by people who would never say these types of things to him in person. The thing about Kamiya is that whether it's people actively trolling him or even just asking him thoughtless questions, he never holds back. He says exactly what he's thinking on Twitter at all times and unflinchingly curates his online experience until all that's left is the good parts. Hence, my timeline becomes immaculate. And while people understandably gravitate towards Kamiya's more combative tweets when discussing his internet presence, there's also another side to the man that often goes completely ignored. My favorite example of this comes from 2017, when news broke that Kamiya's Xbox exclusive game Scalebound had suddenly been cancelled partway through development. By all accounts, Scalebound was a really big deal for Kamiya personally. He had first established the concept for Scalebound over a decade ago back in 2006 alongside Platinum Games co-founders, and this was set to be the first game Kamiya had been in the director's seat for since 2013's Wonderful 101. Scalebound was a game that Kamiya sank at least four years into the development of, so when the game's cancellation was announced, it wasn't surprising that Kamiya took to Twitter to discuss it. But what was surprising was that instead of his signature anger, Kamiya took to Twitter with a heartwarming apology. As you may have already heard, Scalebound has unfortunately been canceled, he wrote. I'm very sorry to everyone who was looking forward to this game. I'll work extra hard to never let you down like this again, so I hope you will keep watching over us in the future too. Immediately after posting this message, Kamiya was swarmed with supportive, positive, loving messages from fans, and an hour later, Kamiya posted one last tweet to share his final message of the day. I thought I would get lots of savage messages, but in reality I'm getting lots of warm messages. Thank you. Followed by a crying cowmoji, which I think it's fair to say is a pretty rare sight from Kamiya. Now, this moment is obviously touching, but I think it also represents the thing that we find so appealing about Kamiya, and that's his vulnerability. Whether it's cruel messages from strangers trying to hurt his feelings, or messages of support from fans during one of the hardest moments in his entire career, Kamiya always responds wholeheartedly. It appears to be just who he is. While working on this video, I reviewed the footage of my encounter with Hideki Kamiya, and the last time I looked, something jumped out at me that I hadn't spotted the first time through. If you look closely, at the very end of the clip, Right after Kamiya shows me his block list of 17,000 people, and right after I tell him that it's amazing, in the upper left corner of the screen for exactly one frame, Kamiya smiled. He was proud. At the end of the day, I think Kamiya's Twitter fascinates us because there is something beautiful about watching somebody unapologetically be themselves. Or, as Kamiya himself once said, you gotta be you, only one in the world. Real quick, I'd like to thank this video's sponsor, OnePlus. Now, if you haven't heard of it, the OnePlus 7 Pro is this really, really insanely fast and powerful Android phone with a Snapdragon 855 processor and up to 12 gigabytes of RAM. Also, if you're anything like me and you're picky about frame rate, the OnePlus 7 Pro has a 90 hertz refresh rate, meaning that it's capable of playing games at up to 90 frames per second. And it actually turns out that Groove Coaster, which is one of my favorite rhythm games of all time, supports the OnePlus 7 Pro's 90 hertz output, which has really, really quickly elevated this device into my favorite Groove Coaster machine of all time. I, I actually cannot describe how happy it's making me to play Groove Coaster on this huge, like 6.67 inch AMOLED screen with like perfect true bl blacks and 90, it's just like, it's the most deluxe way of playing Groove Coaster I've ever experienced, and it has become my default way of playing it from now on. It genuinely just owns. I love it a lot. Anyways, if you want to learn more about the OnePlus 7 Pro and enter to win a OnePlus 7 Pro of your own, plus two tickets to DreamHack Rotterdam and $3,000 in travel credit, be sure to follow OnePlus on Twitter and Instagram and check out the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.